Hi guys, I'm Dr. Tan here. Welcome to today's CME lecture. In this lecture, we are going to discuss about diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome. Both DKA and HSS are actually one of the commonest diabetic emergencies that you will probably encounter during your clinical practice. Therefore, it's important for all clinicians to have a sound knowledge about the general management of these two important uh, diabetic emergencies. This is the overview of the lecture today, in which I will begin with by giving you an introduction about the diabetic situations in Malaysia. Following that, we will discuss about the definitions and pathophysiologies of DKA and HSS. Next, we will move on to the class of the presentation today, which is about the principles of DKA and HSS management. Lastly, I will end the lecture by giving you a few case illustrations in order for you to uh, be aware of the common clinical pitfalls which are absolutely preventable if you have taken the necessary precautions. This table was taken from our Malaysian National Health and Morbidity Survey which was conducted in 2019. It is evident to you that diabetes mellitus was actually very prevalent amongst our Malaysians. To highlight to you, the highest diabetics rate was observed amongst our Indian ethnics, which recorded a hopping 31.4%, and that was followed by our Malay and Chinese ethnics. This is the diagnostic criteria for diabetic ketoacidosis. It is actually represented by the triad. In other words, it means that all these three criteria need to be present in order to say that the person has diabetic ketoacidosis. So the first criteria will be the presence of hyperglycemia, which is defined as blood glucose more than 11 millimol per litre. And the second and third criteria will be the presence of uh, ketosis and also the presence of metabolic acidosis. In regard to the ketosis, it's defined as capillary ketones of 3 millimol per litre or urine ketones of 2 plus and above. So for this uh, metabolic acidosis, the venous pH should be below 7.3 without, without concomitant uh, bicarbonate level that is below 15 millimol per litre. It is important for you to understand that ketosis and metabolic acidosis are actually the hallmark features of DKA. And these two features shouldn't be found in the patients with pure hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome. So now we are looking at the diagnostic criteria for hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome. Again, it is represented by a triad, but this triad are actually very distinctly different from the diagnostic criteria of DKA. So we're gonna look at it one by one. So the first criteria will be the presence of uh, severe dehydration, and the second criteria will be the presence of marked hyperglycemia, defined as blood glucose more than 30 millimol per litre. And again, this diagnostic criteria emphasizes that ketosis and metabolic acidosis shouldn't be present in the patients with pure HSS. And so lastly, the third criteria will be the presence of serum osmolality more than 320 milliosmo per kilogram. This is actually in keeping with the clinical signs of uh, severe dehydration. So next, I would like to bring your attention to the formula that we use to calculate the serum osmolality. To be more specific, we are actually calculating the effective serum osmolality. So the formula is 2 times sodium plus glucose. So it's well to also inform you that this formula is actually slightly different compared to the uh, older formula, which actually include potassium and urea. But these two parameters no longer needed in the latest guidelines for you to calculate this uh, serum osmolality. This table summarizes nicely to you about the pathophysiology of DKA and HSS. Overall, as you can see here that DKA and HSS actually share some common pathophysiological process. But however, what separate DKA and HSS was also depend on the cascade events that happened subsequently, which I'm going to take you through one by one later. But before that, Let's start off with how this uh, hyperglycemic crisis happens. So normally DKA in patient sense, it happens when there is a triggering event which will lead to either a state of absolute insulin deficiencies, which are commonly observed amongst our type 1 diabetic patients, 
or it can lead to a state of relative insulin deficiencies. When either one of these happen in combination with an increase in counter-regulatory hormones like uh, your serum cortisol, your serum catecholamine, or serum growth hormones, it will lead to a cascade of events, as you can see here. So let's take a look at the common pathophysiological process between DKA and HSS. So that would be an uh, increase in gluconeogenesis, an increase in glycogenolysis, and also a decrease in glucose utilizations caused by uh, the above uh, events. So uh, ultimately, it will give rise to a hypoglycemic state. But, but what separate HSS from DKA is that the hypoglycemic state will be more marked as compared to the DKA. So, Understandably, it will cause more market dehydrations and increase in the serum osmolarity, which are the hallmark features of HSS. But having said that, the DKA subjects will suffer from dehydration as well. But because of the dehydration was more marked in HSS, therefore, during the fluid resuscitation status, the fluid use will be even more liberal in our subjects with HSS. So let's take a look at the unique pathophysiological process of DKA. It will be this process that leads to increase in serum ketone bodies that ultimately will cause a DKA. But in clinical practice, it's not uncommon for you to see that in certain subjects, they will have a mixed DKA and HSS features. Before I move on to the most important sections of the lecture today, I would like to introduce you the criteria for ICU and HDU admissions. So this is important because uh, populations such as elderly subjects, pregnant mothers, or subjects with heart failure, kidney failure, or other serious comorbidities, they have to be monitored closely in either the setting of ICU and HDU. And also importantly, in any subjects with severe DKA, which has been defined as below, they also have to be monitored in the setting of ICU and HDU. In the subsequent slides, we are going to discuss about DKA and HSS management. Even though the management of DKA and HSS are almost similar, there are some important clinical differences that you need to be aware of, and I will highlight it to you as I go along the lecture. The first step in the management would be fluid resuscitations and corrections of our electrolyte imbalance. It should be obvious to you that both DKA and HSS subjects they are actually in a dehydrated state when they first present to you. And this table it summarizes nicely to you about the typical water and electrolyte deficits amongst DKA and HSS subjects. So the first column uh, will illustrate the typical water and electrolyte deficits in a DKA subjects. So it's generally believed that the fluid deficit for a DKA subject will be 10% of their body weight. Therefore, in a subject with a 70 kg body weight, the volume to be replaced will be around 7 liters. On the other hand, in subject in HSS, it is believed that the dehydration will be more marked than DKA. Therefore, the fluid resuscitation will be more than 10% of the body weight. As here, you can see that the volume to be replaced could be as high as 2 times of the DKA subjects. Having said that, the most important point for you to know is that these recommendations can only be applied in a healthy subject with a normal cardiac reserve. Therefore, I mentioned to you before this, in subjects with a, a once age cardio or renal comorbidities, these principles are not applicable. So, the next thing I would like to emphasize to you is the purpose of fluid replacement. Besides trying to restore the circulatory volume or to correct the electrolyte imbalance, it also plays a very important role in the clearance of uh, the serum ketones, uh, especially in the case of patients who have uh, DKA at presentations. According to our Malaysian diabetic CPG, it's recommended that the subject should have three IV lines on emissions. This is important because the subject will normally require multiple infusions. So the first infusions will be uh, the maintenance fluid, which is defined as 125 ml per hour, which is almost equivalent to 6 pints in 24 hours with potassium replacement. And the second IV line will be reserved for fluid resuscitations. And the rate of fluid resuscitations would be very dependent on the patient's clinical status. Generally speaking, 
patients with normal cardiac and renal reserve, the first or the second liters of a fluid resuscitation normally will be given in a bolus's manner. And the third important point here is that both DKA and HSN subjects they require fixed rate IV insulin infusions. And for DKA, the infusion rate is recommended to be 0.1 unit per kilogram per hour until ketosis resolves. On the other hand, in subjects with HSS, the fixed rate IV insulin infusion rate is recommended at uh, 0.05 unit per kilogram per hour. This is because uh, in subjects with HSS, they are actually more sensitive to this uh, insulin as the main driver for this HSS is actually dehydration. It is understandable that in certain subjects they may have poor vascular access. But however, there's one thing that we cannot compromise that the IVI insulin infusions must always run on a separate vernula. As I have alluded in the previous slides, the fluid resuscitation will be dependent on the patient's clinical status. So uh, from this table, if any subject who came with a hypovolemic shock, you should run the first pint of uh, normal saline over 10 to 15 minutes and keep in view to repeat the second bolus if the patient's blood pressure doesn't pick up. On the other hand, in the patients that was normal tensive at presentations, we will tend to give the first liter of normal saline over one hour. So after the first hour fluid resuscitations, the subsequent fluid resuscitations will depend on the patient clinical status, but generally you can plan it over the next two hours, the next four hours, as well as the next six to eight hours. But however, it's important for you to know that the amount of fluid deficits actually de differs from subject to subject. Therefore, the key point is that you have to reassess the patients after every fluid boluses to determine the subsequent step in the management. So like what I have uh, mentioned to you in the previous slides, in patients that came with DKHSSS, we would have started them on high maintenance drip, which has been defined as 6 pi normal saline over 24 hours. So it, therefore, it's important for you to take that into account during the fluid resuscitations. So another important point to highlight here is that you have to be very cautious in fluid resuscitating uh, in subjects who are below 18 years old, elderly subjects, pregnancy, or those with uh, existing heart and renal failure. And I will illustrate to you in my final slide to talk about the clinical pitfalls that could happen. To reiterate, the second principles of management would be the introductions of fixed rate insulin infusions. And the insulin infusion rate will be higher in subjects with DKA, which has been defined as 0.1 unit per kilogram per hour. As opposed to DKA, the fixed rate insulin infusion rate will be much lower, which has been defined as 0.05 unit per kilogram per hour. This is because HSS subjects are much more sensitive to this insulin. And also, like I mentioned earlier, the key drivers for HSS is actually market hyperglycemia. Another point to highlight is that even though it may sound counterintuitive, our body actually requires glucose to help in clearing up these serum ketone bodies. Therefore, in any subjects in which the DKA or HSS status hasn't resolved yet, but the plasma glucose has already fallen below 40 millimol per liter, we have to intervene by providing dextrose to the subjects so that the ketolysis process will continue. So uh, what we would do is that we replace the maintenance drip to NSD5 so that the patient would benefit from these uh, you know, dextrose. They will continue to process the ketolysis. And at the same time, you will reduce the insulin infusion rate by 50% so that they will not develop hypoglycemia as a result. The second situation is that if you perceive that the ketonemia is very persistent or refractory, then you may consider give even more dextrose to the subjects. At the same time, you will continue the same fixed insulin infusion rate. A close monitoring of the patient's serum potassium level is warranted as long as the patient is on insulin infusions because uh, continuous insulin infusions would be t similar to as though you are giving an hourly lactic cocktail. 
So based on the serum potassium level, we will decide the amount of potassium replacement to be given in the maintenance drip. I can't overemphasize how important it is for you to reassess the patients frequently and to assess whether the aims of treatment has been achieved or not. So the aims of treatment has been defined as the rate of four ketones of at least 0.5 millimole per liter per hour or a bicarbonate rise of 3 millimole per liter per hour and a plasma glucose 4 of at least 3 millimole per liter per hour and to maintain the serum potassium within normal range. This uh, table is really taken from the DKA management. I would say that these principles can be generally applied to subjects with uh, hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome as well. Besides achieving these biochemical targets, it's also very important for you to have an accurate assessment of the fluid status. And at times when this is challenging, then you may consider performing an ultrasound so that you can have a more guided fluid resuscitation, especially amongst the special populations that I mentioned in the earlier slides and also individuals that are vulnerable to fluid overload. So another quick fact is about the ketone body that exists in the human bodies. So that would uh, allow you to understand why it is important to monitor the serum ketone instead of the urine ketones uh, during the reassessments. So uh, simply put, the ketone body exists in three forms. So the first one will be 3 beta hydroxybutyrate. So this will be the ketone body that you measure from the capillary ketones. And the second one will be the acetyl acetate, which should be the measurable ketone bodies uh, in from the urine dipstick. And the second, the last one will be acetones. So in the management of uh, DKA, it's recommended that you measure the 3 beta hydroxybutyrate rather than the urine ketones because uh, this will be more reflective of the progress of the DKA. And uh, just for you to know, as the DKA improves, it will lead to a drop in the 3 beta hydroxybutyrate. Somehow, it will lead to a paradoxical rise in the urinary acetoacetate level. So if you were to rely on these urinary ketones, then you might be misled sometime. So treating HSS and DKA alone is actually insufficient because uh, you need to identify the precipitating cause and uh, to prevent this from happening again. So the commonly coded causes would be uh, new onset diabetes. For This is uh, especially true amongst type 1 diabetic subjects because that might be the first presentations. And secondly, it can be because of acute infections. From, you, from the history and examinations, you would normally be able to identify the source of infections. But keep in mind that elderly, they may have asymptomatic urinary tract infection, therefore you need to perform a urine dipstick for any subjects that are present to you with a DKA and HSS. And also it can be because of uh, non-compliance to these uh, treatments and also can be because of intercurrent illnesses like uh, myocardial infection, CVS and so on and so forth. And uh, in the context of uh, COVID era, I think uh, it's not uncommon for you to see patients develop DKA after receiving these uh, high potency steroids, for example, like methylprednisolone. All subjects with DKA or HSS should receive prophylactic low molecular weight heparin for the full durations of emissions unless it is contraindicated. This is because uh, these subjects are actually at an increased risk of uh, arterial or venous thrombosis during this uh, diabetic crisis. The next important checkpoint is that to you know when DKA or HSS has resolved so that you know when to plan the conversions of uh, parenteral insulin to the subcutaneous forms. So resolutions of DKA has been defined as a pH above 7.3 and the plasma ketones below 0.6 mmol per liter. On the other hand, resolutions of hyperosmolar hyperglycemic syndrome is defined as when the patient is alert, eating well, and her serum osmolality of less than 320 minutes osmol per kilogram and the plasma glucose level should be below 14 millimole per liter. And for the subcutaneous insulin conversions, you may choose either basal bolus insulin or premixed regimens depending on the patient's lifestyle and also how tight the glycemic control has to be. And it's recommended that you should stop the intravenous insulin infusion 60 minutes after injecting the subcutaneous short-acting insulin 
This is because uh, a premature withdrawal of this IV insulin infusion might lead to a rebound in hyperglycemia. So the amount of insulin to be given to the patients uh, relies on multiple factors. So the first thing to consider is whether is the patient an insulin naive subject. If that is the case, then the starting dose uh, can be calculated from this uh, total daily dose based on the body weight, which has been defined as 0.5 to 0.7 unit per kilogram per day. On the other hand, in subjects that have been on insulin previously, then you have two options. So first would be to uh, step back the previous uh, insulin regimen that patients has been on before presentations and to adjust it accordingly. So another strategy would be to uh, get the estimated total daily dose based on the hourly insulin dose. So it's important to take note that you should start including the hourly insulin dose after the patient has recovered from VKA or in other words the insulin dose required will be those that required to maintain the blood glucose of 8 to 12 millimole per liters and uh, based on this you try to obtain the mean hourly rate then you further multiply it to 20 by 24 hours to get the actual total daily insulin requirement and based on these values right then you further divide it into into half and the first 50% will be the dose required for your basal insulin and the remaining 50% will be divided equally among that three prandial insulins. What I mentioned just now was a very ideal situation where you have 50% basal, 50% you know, pre-meals insulin. In real life, that is hardly happening because uh, our Malaysians is actually practicing a rice-based diet Therefore, it contributes to the fact that most of them will require a higher proportion of uh, premium insulin. So uh, beside this fact, it's also important for you to know that the main purpose for you to calculate this is so that the patient doesn't relapse back into DKA or HSS. So uh, after, after you convert to the subcutaneous insulin, you need further titrations you know, to achieve the targets that you have set for the patients and uh, therefore you need to refer to the dietitians and also to refer to our diabetic nurse for further counseling. We have come to the final part of the lecture today which is also one of the most important parts of the lecture so which is about the clinical pitfalls. So the first pitfall would be the complications of unmonitored fully resuscitations. So to illustrate my point, I would like to share with you this table. So this was how we were taught before this, you know, how we should, uh, you know, resuscitate our patients, you know, give one liter over one hour, another liter two hours, two hours, four hours, four hours, and six hours. According to our latest Malaysian CPGs, we try not to impart this kind of message to your mind anymore. Instead, we recommend you to start with a high maintenance uh, IV drip, which is defined as uh, around six pint, around six pint of drip maintenance drip. Then you give boluses when necessary. So in the sense that your fluid re resuscitations can stop after two hours or maybe after five hours, depends on the fluid deficit and also the patient's clinical conditions. Before I move on to the case illustrations, I would like you to understand the compounds uh, within these normal saline and Hartman solutions. Quite commonly, we will switch in between these solutions depends on the serum sodium level that our patient has. So uh, first, let's take a look at these uh, normal saline uh, label. So you have 150 millimole per liter uh, of uh, sodium and chloride. So uh, on the other hand, uh, we look at these uh, Hartman solutions which has also been known as a more balanced solution because uh, as you can see the sodium levels and the chloride levels was only 131 and 111 as opposed to a higher concentration in normal saline so therefore these concentrations is actually uh, will be less likely to cause uh, hypernatremia but having said that the first lines of uh, fluid resuscitation uh, solution will still be normal saline unless that the patients already have hypernatremia or other contraindications in the beginnings. So besides this uh, sodium and chloride contents, right, Hartman saline also have additional uh, compounds like calcium, chloride and bicarbonate. So as I have illustrated to you uh, before this, sodium chloride and Hartman solutions 
are actually very different solutions and each of them have different advantages and disadvantages but what I would like to highlight particularly in this slide is that excessive sodium and excessive chloride load will lead to a clinical conditions known as hyperchloridemic metabolic acidosis which may cause renal arterial vasoconstriction leading to oliguria and the slowing of resolution of acidosis uh, because of this, it's important for you to monitor the patient's serum sodium level throughout during the bolus uh, resuscitations because if the patient already uh, exhibits signs of uh, excessive uh, sodium or chloride, then you have to switch them over to a more balanced solutions, for example, like Hartman solutions. So this slide illustrates to you the complications of iatrogenic sodium and chloride overload. So these subjects have been given an excessive amounts of normal sunlight resuscitations, but however their monitoring uh, wasn't done in a proper manner. So it has resulted in hyperchloridemic metabolic acidosis, which uh, further exacerbate the acute kidney injury. So the take-home measure is that you have to repeat their blood parameters, especially these uh, electrolytes uh, levels at uh, regular intervals during the initial fluid resuscitation phase. If you were to see the trends of uh, that the sodium level has been in the uptrend, then you may consider switching over to uh, Hartman solutions to prevent the patient from developing a full-blown hyperchloridemic metabolic acidosis. This case illustrations highlight to you that not all clinical derangements are due to diabetic crisis itself. Most of the time, the patient will have a mixed pathologies. So in this case, it's obvious to you that the patient was tachycardic at presentations, and it was uh, assumed to be due to dehydration, which is true initially. But however, over the days, despite adequate fluid resuscitations, the heart rate did not come down. In fact, it went higher. So I think this will raise a red flag that the patient could have tachycardia due to other causes like undiagnosed uh, hyperthyroidism, you know, have a, you know, have, could have a pulmonary embolism or have a myocarditis and so on and so forth. So it's definitely wrong for you to, you know, going through the repeated cycles of fluid resuscitations in the hope that the heart rate will come down. And true enough, this patient actually has undiagnosed hyperthyroidism. The last point to drive home is that you have to understand that not all metabolic acidosis are due to DKA itself. Sometimes the patients could have an additional uh, diagnosis that hasn't been diagnosed yet. Therefore, you have to be cognizant about the differential diagnosis of uh, metabolic acidosis. And uh, commonly illustrated uh, differentials would be uh, lactate acidosis, such as uh, in the subjects who have shock infections or tissue ischemia, or in subjects with uh, you know, alcohol intoxications or methanol intoxications. By knowing all this, it will allow you to know when to you know, perform additional investigations and also to switch your management plan. Also, I would like to spend the last slide to highlight the importance of ultrasounds in guiding us during the fluid resuscitations uh, process, especially among our elderly subjects, pregnant mothers, and individuals with uh, renal or cardiac comorbidities. So please have a very low threshold to use the ultrasounds you know, to guide you, especially when you are in a diagnostic or in a clinical conundrum. Thank you for staying until the end of this lecture. I hope you have uh, learned a lot from this lecture and please subscribe to the channels and share it with your friends who might benefit from this uh, educational lecture.